Okie dokie. Good morning, everybody. Here we are. We are here on this lovely Wednesday to do another round of the Astro Babble. Um, I am actually extremely thrilled this morning. It is a lovely 64 degrees here in, in Tampa, Florida. And uh, I've got a pumpkin spice latte and I am feeling the fall. Trust me. Um, favorite time of year, that crispness. Mm, so delicious. Uh, so we are here to dissect another five charts that have been donated by you, my lovely followers. We are going live on Facebook and Instagram simultaneously. Um, hopefully I'll be able to figure out how to go live on multiple platforms in one software soon. I am working on that for you. Mm. Um, but yeah, so we're going to talk about five charts, give you some astro lowdown, talk about current transits and past transits and shed some light on some life stuff and just have fun. Um, it's called a babble for a reason. I'm just going to ramble for a little bit. Uh, thank you all for indulging me in, in this practice. And uh, as always, if you would like to be a part of the live stream, you can always uh, donate your chart by private messaging me your birth date, place, and exact birth time. Uh, the list is rather long, so please be patient. Um, you can always send in friends and family with their consent as well. Um, I do do pets. I got that question last time, but we do need the time of birth. Uh, so normally, uh, normally like dogs and cats that have been uh, adopted from a breeder uh, where the birth was actually timed at that at that space. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to work one-on-one, -on -one, if you would like to schedule a private consult with me or learn astrology, you can always do that through my website, scorpiorisingastrology.com. Enough about me. Let's talk about the, let's talk about the charts, shall we? Okay, so chart number one is going to be second Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Cheers, my dear. Good morning. How are you? Um, let's take a peek at seconds chart. Ooh, 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 ooh. Always, always makes me a little bit nervous when we have an ascendant at 29 degrees, but, or, um, just kidding. Just kidding. My eyes aren't working this morning. Ascendant at three degrees north node at 29 degrees we're safe north node is much slower than the ascendant uh the reason why birth time is so important in a lot of these charts is because literally 10 minutes can make a difference so if you're guessing if you're guesstimating and we're doing these these readings and you're like mm, no sam sam's kind of off i guarantee if we had the right birth time the chart would be accurate um so we just need to be really really specific about that but this chart we're we're perfectly fine seconds good three degrees leo we're we're strong into the sign um so we've got a three degree leo ascendant we've got that spark of fixed fire energy that leo comes forward a little bit of drama yeah a little bit of razzle dazzle um love love a good leo placement which puts the sun as the ruler of the chart the sun is up in the eighth house in pisces which brings that fire and combines it with some water energy we also have a very detrimented mercury in that eighth house as well which is going to pose a little bit of a problem throughout the chart nice earthy capricorn moon to ground it out though so we've got three different sides to seconds chart and this is something that i talk about with clients a lot is the chart is a promise yeah, the chart is a promise that you gave to yourself that I will be these things. I will express these virtues and these attributes, and I will use these tools in life appropriately. Um, if you use them inappropriately or you fail to express them, that's when life tends to go to shit. Yeah, uh, so we just need to be aware of that. And here we have a Leo ascendant that needs to be expressed. We need to kind of be the center of attention. We need to be able to sniff out talent and to appreciate others for their abilities and to also take center stage when your name is called. We also have a very, very sensitive and intuitive Pisces sun in the eighth house of death. Like that's going to be mediumship abilities. That's going to be a lot of intuitive development uh, that needs to come forward very, very strongly. And then we have this moon in Capricorn in the sixth house of work and that that very determined cardinal earth energy where, you know, when I when I talk about Capricorn, I always think of the tortoise and the hare and Capricorn being the tortoise. It's slow and steady wins the race. Capricorn is in it for the long haul. And by long haul, I mean like the 20, 40 year long haul. Um, Capricorn is very slow moving, but when it moves, it is deliberate, it is decisive, and it always has power and passion behind that movement. Um, so it's, it's just such a great moon placement to have, even though the moon is in her fall, she doesn't really like to be in Capricorn. If there's a place for a moon in Capricorn to be, it's in the sixth house of work. It gives you a killer work ethic. Um, and I really, really enjoy that for sure. 
So these are the three kind of core aspects of the personality that we need to express in seconds chart. If any one of these three are not getting their time in the sun, they're not getting their, their expression and the personality, then we're going to start to see them flip into their negative aspects. Leo is going to be very boisterous and start to become the resentful attention hog. Pisces is going to collapse into a puddle of tears and start to compromise their own boundaries for attention. And then Capricorn is going to start to criticize and isolate um, and push people away by being too um, curmudgeon-y would be a good way to say it. So this is this is the, the style of the chart that we need to really understand and embrace these qualities first and foremost. Let's talk about this uh, this detrimented Mercury. So when we when we look at a planet in a chart, there are there are factors that make it good and there are factors that make it not so good. Um, let's kind of veer off into Venus real quick as an example. So in this chart, we have Venus and Taurus in the 10th house. Mwah! Fabulous. Our Lady Venus, who is perpetually abundant and lovely in her home sign of Taurus in the 10th house of success. Beautiful, beautiful placement. Absolutely fabulous. Contrast that with Mercury, our Lord of Perpetual Communication, who is in his least favorite sign of Pisces, retrograde, which means he's going backwards in the skies. He's at the slowest point of his cycle, um, and he's in the eighth house of death. Er, um, not necessarily a great placement. So what this is going to do to the native is it's going to compromise Mercury's abilities in the chart. This means that language and speaking is going to be something that will be innately difficult. The mind will kind of be a monkey mind. It will be a little bit out of control. Um, and the ability to translate thoughts into speech uh, is going to be a little bit difficult because of that. Now, I like a Pisces sun on top of this because it really tells us that this person is a little bit more empathic than, than verbal or mental. Um, the mind starts to get confused. The words start to get jumbled. It becomes a whole Tower of Babel situation. But with the sun and Pisces coming forward, it's very much a heart-to-heart -heart conversation that this person likes to have. Um, as opposed to a mental a mental one. Now that doesn't mean that we can avoid conversation and communication. And in fact, this is a perfect example of a chart that I would suggest Mercury remediation for. We need to set up an altar to Mercury. We need to honor him on Wednesdays, today's, um, by giving him offerings of coffee and incense uh, to make sure that we appease or channel that energy of mentality and communication, especially when that energy is needed. Um, like as an example, because of that moon in Capricorn in the sixth, there's going to be a strong work ethic, a strong work drive. Maybe you have a really important meeting that you need to attend and that you need to be heard. Yeah. Um, and you need to be heard concisely. Then we would petition Mercury, uh, preferably the Wednesday before that meeting, to make sure that we gain the favor of that planetary attribute. So that's how we would do that. It's also tricky because Mercury in this chart is ruling your second house of finances, where we find Mars retrograde, Jupiter retrograde, and Saturn retrograde. That's a lot of retrograde in the financial house. I'm not a fan of that. And to have a retrograde planet ruling all these retrograde planets in your <laughs> in your second house of finance, if you're finding <laughs> if you're finding any issues with money whatsoever, we would need to go back to that Mercury and remediate that Mercury for sure. Um, yeah, uh, especially with Saturn here, like Saturn is all about saying no, 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 no. Saturn, especially Saturn retrograde, especially Saturn in a, in a detail oriented sign like Virgo. Um, Saturn and Virgo retrograde in the second house has a very interesting expression. And I've seen this a couple times in charts where it's like somebody will literally wear the clothes on their back so hard into the ground uh, that they'll start to develop holes, rips, tears. They'll try to mend them themselves. They'll try to like wash out the stains over and over and over to where the clothes get faded and bleached because they're just so eager about saving money and pinching every penny that they can. Or it's the exact opposite end of the, of the spectrum. And there's a blind spot when it comes to money and personal possessions. So there might be uh, the opposite where Saturn Saturn starts to make the case why everything is important and that we need to buy everything that we see. Um, 
So those are the two ends. But Saturn as the Lord of Boundaries in Virgo, the literal mutable earth sign who rules boundaries retrograde backwards, there's going to be a boundary issue when it comes to finances. And that could be super extreme in terms of uh, conservation, or that could be super extreme in terms of spending. Um, and that polarity that needs to be balanced with the financial house, again, we go back to Mercury for that. I think that's it. I think that's it for this chart. Um, I think those are some pretty key points. Awesome. Thank you, Second, for donating your chart uh, to science for the live stream. Um, I very, very much appreciate it. Uh, good morning, Delilah. Good morning, Beth. Good morning, everybody who is uh, jumping on. I appreciate you. Let's go ahead and we'll move to chart number two. Chart number two is going to be Becky. Good morning, Becky. Cheers. How are you? Um, nice, strong Cancer Ascendant right off the bat. Moon and Libra down in the fourth. Applying to conjunction with the North Node. I'm here for it. Okay. A rather stubborn relationship house. Again, Sun in the eighth. What is this theme? The Sun in the eighth. Um, really slow Mars and Taurus. Okay, we've got a snapshot. So. Having Cancer on the Ascendant makes you uniquely sensitive, right? Anytime we see a water sign on the Ascendant, we just need to be aware that empathy uh, is part of the dynamic of the chart, um, especially Cancer being the sign of the mother. It's the caretaking sign of the Zodiac. Um, and that is kind of when, when, I, when I'm asked to describe the Ascendant, right? Um, I often say it's the sign that is stamped on your spirit at the time of, at the time of your birth. Um, in some ways, it's a little bit more important than the than the sun sign. You know, we have we're running around in a culture that's obsessed with sun sign astrology, but we have to recognize that the ascendant is the helm of the chart. So whatever the ascendant is, uh, that's going to be the major flavor that dominates the personality in addition to the sun sign. But they operate in very different ways. And if you if you've never resonated with your sun sign, it might be a good time to explore your ascendant or your moon sign. Um, as well. So anyway, back to Becky. So Becky has a Cancer Ascendant, which means the moon is the ruler of her chart. The moon is here down in the fourth in Libra, the sign of the scales and the sign of balance. Now, what happens when somebody puts the ruler of their chart in the fourth house, especially a very sensitive uh, planet like the moon, is we see home is literally where the heart is. Uh, we see a strong emotional attachment to family, especially because the North Node is here, co-present with the Moon. We find that there's a strong pull to develop one's own family um, and to really make sure that potential karmic cycles are broken. Um, but then also just the idea of wrapping oneself in the blanket of family uh, in order to find emotional comfort. That's such a huge, that's such a huge thing for a Moon uh, ruled chart in the fourth house. Also, the idea of owning property. Yeah, the idea of potentially um, becoming a landlord, depending on where. Oh, yeah, becoming a landlord, especially with Venus and in, in Aquarius in the eighth house of business, um, taxes, estates, things like that. Definitely becoming a landlord would be an interesting kind of dynamic in the chart to explore. Uh, let's see, working with children, there's a marker for in the chart. We have Jupiter, uh, Lord of Prosperity, ruling the sixth house of work via Scorpio, the sign of sexuality in the fifth house of children and parenting. So that's always that's always a really good marker for working with children, but especially because Scorpio is present, potentially working with children who are a little bit more into that underworld aspect. So that could be mentoring children, that could be working with children who have experienced a certain amount of trauma in the life, especially with Neptune here, uh, the children of parents who were abusive or who used a lot of substances. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if you used some of that kind of counseling ability in your chart uh, to work with children who are a little bit more on that rough and tough side due to that Scorpio energy. Uh, Sun in Aquarius really, really starts to define you as the rebel, um, and that's something that I that's something that I love about charts like this, where it's like we have this nurturing side of Cancer, we have this Moon in the fourth that really just wants to be safe and tucked away in the home space, and then we have this Sun in Aquarius that just wants to break all the rules um, and 
say screw you to society and just go off on their own and really make a name for themselves and that's very much the rebel of aquarius coming forward in the eighth house of business um as well as venus coming forward uh from this place ruling the home and the friendship cycles of the of the chart there's a lot of really fun dynamics here when it comes to uh you know taking that comfort level of the moon and the ascendant placement and then pairing it with the discomfort or the intentional discord that uh the strong sun in aquarius brings into the the dynamic very cool polarity for sure um let's talk about relationships as well because we have some interesting relationship placements having having mercury here in capricorn and then having saturn in capricorn as well in the seventh house of relationships does attract a rather stubborn partner um but you enjoy that you enjoy somebody who's you know able to fend for themselves you enjoy somebody who you can actually take care of as a person um and this is this is kind of the perpetual curse of cancer if i'm being honest is we we very much enjoy people who play hard to get in the emotional department because we think that oh their coldness means that they're uncomfortable so we have to take care of them and we're the only people who can break through their their exterior their rough exterior and that's not necessarily the case right however however you're naturally attracted to a partner who's very business savvy who tends to be very standoffish who tends to be uh very strong-minded very stubborn very intellectual um but who largely lords their life experience over others yeah, it's it's just kind of the Saturn and Capricorn way, um, and you're attracted to that essence. Let's see. Also, wouldn't surprise me if you go into business with a partner, with a spouse, um, because that Saturn is ruling the eighth house of business where your son is located from the seventh of relationships. Mm -hmm. um if you if you are struggling to find a spouse or if you would like to connect with any potential relationship partners um you'll probably find them in the teaching space the teaching writing speaking space so go attend a workshop go attend a university you'll probably fall in love with a teacher um or somebody who has extensive experience in the in the motivational speaking or educational kind of dynamic Uh, personal finance tends to be a little bit tricky in your chart with Uranus retrograde in Leo. So we want to make sure that we're leveraging other people's money and seeking out the advice of a good accountant, not necessarily relying on yourself for your financial maintenance. And yeah, I think that's it. There's a strong marker for adoption as well in the chart, with the MC in Pisces ruled by Jupiter in the fifth uh, from the ninth. So if for some reason conception is, is a little bit difficult, uh, it might behoove you to adopt uh, or to foster as well. Cool. Thank you, Becky. Thank you for donating your charts to the live stream. Uh, good morning, good morning, good morning. Is everybody able to see the the charts okay? Um, for some reason I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to show the charts, but I want to make sure that I want to make sure that everybody can see them. So let me know in the chat that you can see them okay. I just want to make sure that we're we're going live on Facebook uh, and showing those appropriately. Okie dokie, third chart of the morning is uh, Levy. Cheers, Levy, how are you? Or Levi, depending on how you pronounce it. I apologize for the mispronunciation. Either way, uh, let's take a peek at, at Levi's chart. Aries Ascendant, Uranus and Aries, Moon Square Ascendant, that's tricky. Exalted Mars though, brava. Oh, Sun Trine Ascendant, glorious, glorious. What a detriment of Venus. Ooh, that's tricky. Ooh, that's tricky. Excuse me, I've been feeling that sneeze for, for a while now.
Okay, Levy, so let's talk about your chart for two seconds. We've got an Aries Ascendant, so that naturally means you're a little bit more fiery than most, a little bit more of a leadership quality, a little bit more of somebody who tends to take charge, somebody who tends to be... <coughs> Woo. Speaking of Aries, who rules the head, getting a little bit fiery in the, in the sinus department this morning. Um, so Aries tends to be that fire, that fire on fire, that cardinal fire, that leadership oriented sign. Here we see it on the ascendant, which naturally imbues you with those qualities. And we'll talk about your Mars ruling the chart, which is just absolutely fabulous. You've got a great Mars coming forward. Um, but we also have Uranus here in the first house, which is a little bit tricky, if I'm being honest. Uranus is the planet of unpredictability. It's the planet of disruption. Um, it's a planet that's naturally associated with things like disasters. Um, and to have that in the first house of the self, it really does make the personality a little bit too spunky, a little bit too wild. Um, uh, that wild child energy is definitely something that you'll need to learn how to tame throughout the life. However, some of the ways that you choose to tame it might also be the exact opposite of where you need to go. And, and let me tell you what I mean when I say that. We have the moon in Capricorn here, which naturally would be a good, a good counterbalance, yeah? Because the moon in Capricorn is naturally rather reserved, yeah? It takes all those emotions and it starts to hide them behind a stony exterior. However, going from hot to cold like that can sometimes be a little bit of an issue. A little bit of an issue, if I do say so myself. Um, so we just need to make sure that if you, if, you found, if you find yourself a little bit too wound up, yeah, step yourself down gradually. Don't go from hot to cold right away, because that's going to screw with your nervous system long term. Yeah, it's also going to, it's also going to imprint upon you that your emotions and your energy level are a bad thing and they're not they're totally not um but they need to be channeled appropriately yeah so we need to be able to gradually step you up to high energy and gradually step you down from high energy instead of just leaping forward leaping backward but this Mars, this Mars in Capricorn in the 10th house is ruling the chart. And I really, really enjoy this because Mars is the planet of action. It's the planet of will. It's the planet of drive. It's that warrior energy. And it's in its exaltation in Capricorn. It's the perfect place for Mars to be. And it's in the 10th house of success, like so driven, uh, so aligned with career and purpose. Uh, fame is definitely something that we see in the chart with this expression. Uh, famous in sports, famous in warrior-based activities, famous in just like your ability to go for the gold. I would highly, highly encourage athletics though, because Mars is all about the athletic department. Um, and being recognized for that will definitely be very, very strong as a theme throughout your chart. But, and I say but, because we have issues with the other planets in the chart who are not expressed because these fiery planets are taking place. So with all of this heat, with all of this purpose, with all of this drive, my dear, you intentionally push away the opposite side of the spectrum, yeah? And if we take a lesson from the Tao, the Tao Te Ching, it's this idea of every yang has its yin, yeah? Every light has its darkness. And when we go, 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 do, 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 achieve, 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 which your chart is very poised to do fabulously, right? You ignore the idea of rest. You ignore the idea of stillness, and you ignore the idea of appropriate inaction. Yeah, and that can be that can be very detrimental to somebody who's used to performing and who craves to perform at such a high level with all these fiery placements. Like your son in Sagittarius is making a trine to your ascendant in Aries. I can't get over how hot your chart is, and I don't mean hot like 
attractive. I mean, hot, like, energetically, so fiery, so intense, um, so driven, yeah? But if you're on fire all of the time, you're gonna burn out, yeah? And unfortunately, the planets that we would see that would kind of pull you back um, are not necessarily in the greatest spot. We have Venus, who's in her detriment in uh, or in her fall in Scorpio. We have Neptune in Pisces in the 12th um, and Saturn in Scorpio in the 8th as well. There's this, there's this unexpressed, we'll use the word passive, yeah? There's this unexpressed passive quality in your chart because you're constantly trying to move forward. You forget that sometimes taking a step backwards is the best way forward for you at that time. Um, and we need to respect that. We need to respect that the rest aspect of your chart is not easy. It does not come easy for you at all. But if it is not expressed, I worry. I worry, darling. And I worry specifically because of this Neptune right here. I worry because of this Neptune in Pisces in the 12th house. Because Neptune, Neptune makes things muddy. Pisces as the fish is known to have drinking problems. And the 12th house is the house of hospitalizations and rehab. And I want to make sure that you don't burn out and then seek substances in order to counterbalance this burnout. Yeah, to drown your sorrows. Because one of the things that rest does is it helps us to process emotion. And if you're go, go, go all the time and you don't stop to process, then the monsters start to get really big and really scary. Yeah, and the subconscious starts to get really, really active. And we need to make sure that your body and your mind and your spirit has time to process all of this action and all of this fire and the consequences to those actions. Yeah. Especially when stress is high. Otherwise, you're going to seek other outlets and those other out outlets might not be the healthiest choice. So just it would be highly important for you to investigate emotional intelligence. It would be highly important for you to um, potentially seek counseling on a regular basis, just to have a structured thing in your life to make sure that you're coming back to yourself instead of constantly trying to put yourself out there and go and do. And I think if you learn how to master that, you will master your chart and everything else will fall in your favor because there's nothing that you can't do with these fiery placements. There's literally nothing that you can't do except potentially stay still, process, and work on yourself. Yeah, that's the major weakness of these placements is they're too active. Yeah. So if you take that core lesson of your chart to heart and you start to break down and, and work on yourself, that's really where this chart kind of needs to be. So that's the advice that I would like to give you this morning. Levi. Thank you for donating your chart and for being curious about astrology. Uh, good. I'm glad that the charts are, are legible. Uh, okay. Moving on to our next chart. Let's go to Ryan from TikTok. Uh, I did the all call a couple weeks ago across all my platforms, TikTok included, and Ryan was kind enough to donate uh, his chart uh, via TikTok. So let's take a peek at Ryan's chart. Ryan, my dude, Jupiter in Sagittarius right next to the Ascendant, get over yourself. Get over yourself. That's crazy. So crazy. Pair that with a sextile to your Libra sun. Get out. Ruled by Venus and Libra. Get out. Ah, oh, the luck I can't even. The luck I can't even. Um... In certain charts, in certain charts, right, uh, we have good luck terms. And this is an example of a good luck term. We have Jupiter, the Lord of Abundance, the Lord of Luck, the Lord of all things jovial, in his home sign of Sagittarius, uh, so close to the Ascendant in Sagittarius. Now, now, it's not all good news, and Ryan knows this for a fact, because there's Uranus in Sagittarius and Neptune in Sagittarius, which are two big old roulette wheels that can sometimes not land in Ryan's favor. Now, you do have the grace of Jupiter. 
you do have the grace of Jupiter. That's a fact. That's a fact, right? When in doubt, the Lord of Abundance is, is smiling in your favor. He has blessed your chart, right? However, Uranus will get you into trouble because you think, what could possibly go wrong? And Uranus is like, let me tell you. Uh, and then Neptune and Sagittarius naturally compromises boundary issues. It also makes the liver, the hips, and the vessels rather unpredictable and medically unstable. Also, cirrhosis of the liver, fun fact, or a fatty or enlarged liver is something that we'll see in this chart profile from a medical perspective. So you would be a great candidate for sobriety. You would be a great candidate to make sure that you don't get diabetes from excessive blood sugar stuff. Uh, and we just need to make sure that if your body starts to do weird things in the hips or the vessels, the veins, the, the uh, cardiovascular system in the extremities, that you pay attention to that because that might be a sign of a deeper medical issue. So that's, that's just kind of what we see with such a packed first house. However, that Jupiter is making a sextile to the sun in Libra, which is glorious. I love that for you. I love that for you. It's another, it's another kind of way that Jupiter shines his luck on you is that Libra third house. You're a writer, you're a teacher, you're a speaker, you're here to really make sure that um, your influence shines brightly and positively on the on the faces of others and to also have freaking venus and libra here get over yourself goddess of goddess of love in her home sign of libra the sign of justice like it just gives you this sweet 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 sugar coating around your chart ah oh, it i love it i love it so much now there is an issue though the issue comes from Saturn. So Saturn is at four degrees making a square to your four degree sun, and that's a problem. And it comes from the 12th house, and the 12th house is the house of deeper development. It's where we go to cook, yeah? Uh, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not so intentionally. It rules things like hospitalizations. Uh, it rules things like uh, jail. It, ru it rules things like retreats. It rules things like the karmic healing process, right? So when we see Saturn, the Lord of Restrictions, squaring that Libra sun via the third house of communication, I think one of the things you might struggle with is to talk about uh, the deeper, darker side of your healing journey. However, I would encourage you to do so because that's exactly what people want to hear. That's exactly what people want to hear is they want to see this person who is they want to hear this person who is otherwise so blessed right can can falter like the gods have faults right and you can be the perfect spokesperson for that to be like yeah life is messy and choices are sometimes difficult and sometimes we make the wrong ones but but in making the wrong choices you learn how to do things the right way and that's that's kind of the blessing of your chart so that's that little tricky with the mercury so you have a retrograde mercury in the chart in capricorn in the second house of finance this is a negative financial placement so i really want to make sure that you have somebody else touching your money specifically with taxes because mercury is the literal planet of of monetary exchange right uh so we want to make sure that you having mercury retrograde in your second house of finance uh, which is a very not okay Mercury placement, that you have somebody taking your money for you, looking at it objectively, and then filing on your behalf, who has better financial placements than you do. Fun fact, I encourage you to get your birth date place and time for everybody in your life, including your CPA. Uh, that's a fun exercise, because sometimes people are just, you know, a CPA for a job, and other times they're really good with money, and there's, there's a difference. There's a difference. Um, so yeah, and that Mercury is ruling the seventh house of relationships. So money and money and spousal connections will always be together for you. Always be together for you. Ouch, 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 ouch. And speaking of those two houses, money and relationships being connected, the bullshit that's happening right now in Capricorn is happening through your financial house, which rules your relationship house via that Mercury. So. So let me say that things are, Saturn literally just stationed direct this morning. 
Uh, things are getting better, but they're getting better very, very slowly. But they are getting better for you financially and relationship-wise, but all of this nonsense won't really officially clear out until December 19th. So just keep your head down, be conservative financially, don't make any big purchases, and really just kind of lean into your self-growth and self-development. Because again, I love the third house of your chart. I love the writing, teaching, communication for you. I love using that that Jupiter and Sagittarius to your advantage. I love all of these, these blessings that you can bestow upon others, specifically blessings that are acquired through the rough times of your life. But we need to understand that the more practical stuff, like how you make money uh, and the relationship dynamic of your chart is astrologically unfavored right now. Uh, and that's okay, but these cycles need to be respected. So it's not just you, the stars are kind of against you at this point, uh, but they're against everybody. It just so happens you've taken this, this uh, astrological pile up and put it into your second house of finance. But that will again clear mid-December and everything will be much easier then. Okay, so let's go ahead and move to our last chart of the morning. That's Ryan's chart again. We need to go to Lorianne. Lorianne is chart number five. Let's take a peek at Lorianne's chart. Ah, the Aries stellium. The Aries stellium. I saw this chart when I, uh, when I pulled it up and I was like, ooh, that's going to be fun to talk about for sure. Uh, and when I say fun, I mean... Meh, subjective fun. Uh, so here's what we've got. We've got Mercury in Aries, Ascendant in Aries, Mars in Aries, so the Lord of the chart in Aries in, in the first house, uh, as well as Sun in Aries, Venus in Aries. This is tricky. This is tricky. Normally we would look at this and be like, wow, so much Aries energy. That's amazing. That's so cool. That's wonderful. It is not that cool. It is not that wonderful. And here's the reason. Here's the reason. Your Venus and your Mars are both combust the sun. Yeah. So that Aries energy is too hot too fiery. The sun is in his exaltation. He's at his brightest point. There's a lot of really great solar energy here, but, but you're a triple, no, you're a double fire sign, but I would consider you a triple fire sign because we have the Lord of the chart here. Ascendant in Aries, Mars in Aries, and Sun in Aries packed together. The sun is catching Mars on fire, catching Venus on fire because of proximity, there's too much fire in your chart. And we talked about this a couple charts back as well. The idea of too much yang, too much activity, too much, uh, just too much action. Yeah, too much of that leadership quality, too much of that initiatory dynamic. And yes, like Mercury and Aries with quick wit and sharp ideas and constantly trying to be that ideas person of the group and letting that fire uh, move you forward and really work to your advantage. Like, that's great. That's fun. That makes you a nice leader. But so much Aries, so much Aries with a detrimented Venus means that you're you're leaning too heavily on that cardinal placement. So... As an example, let's look at Libra, the opposite sign. So we have the scales, right? We have Aries, who is cardinal fire, and there's so much of that energy here. But then Venus, who would counterbalance Mars, yeah, as in terms of like yin and yang, right? Venus is in Aries, the sign of her fall. She does not like to be in Aries. She's in Mars's sign. She doesn't like it, yeah? So Venus, who would balance you out naturally, can't do that. So it even tips the favor um, of Mars even further in the overheated direction. And you have your moon in Virgo in the sixth house of work. So it naturally makes you a workaholic energy, uh, having that kind of workaholic energy anyway. And I just, I don't like so much heat in your chart. We need to do some Venus remediation. We need to remind you how to do this thing called rest how an action can be just important as action. Like it's some of the same things that we were telling Levi, um, the third chart in our, uh, our lineup. In fact, to go back and watch that, like it's a good, it's a good example of what it means to have too much heat, too much fire in the chart. Uh, now 
there are a couple things about that that Mars, like that Mars and that Sun being so strong and being in co-rulership, like that's a beautiful thing and it really allows you to battering ram down doors when you need to. But sometimes, sometimes like you just need to knock and and jiggle the handle a little bit and surprise it was open the whole time. You didn't need to, you know, use all of your force and break the door down and waste all of this energy and make a negative first impression by flaunting the power that nobody asked you to flaunt. Like Aries at its worst can be so destructive, right? At its best, it can be an excellent inspirational leader. It can be so fun and playful and dynamic and uh, really get people out of their own way and to open up roadblocks and to be just a positive force for good. However, I'm seeing that the Aries energy being a little bit too high. So we need to lean into Venus. We need to lean, in, lean into the feminine principle. We need to get a little bit more of your watery energy, a little bit more of your earthy energy coming forward in the chart so that we don't, uh, so that we don't spontaneously combust. So that's that. Um, and I think one of the things that naturally will help you is your choice in spouse. So you have somebody who's naturally going to compliment you. The issue is the issue with the spouse that you're attracted to is you're looking for somebody to keep you in check. You're looking for somebody to keep you balanced. You're looking for somebody to give you the other side of the equation so you can consider it. But then the minute that they offer up this other side of the equation, the minute that they strive for balance and they say, hey, have you considered this option? you quickly retort back with, prove it to me, prove it to me. Uh, and that's whenever we see Venus and Aries, especially Venus and Aries ruling the seventh house of relationships, your spouse can be exceedingly frustrated by this idea that they need to prove their love to you through things like self-growth um, and constantly defending their ideas. Like it's that warrior Venus, that Durga energy, where she's like, let me test your boundaries. Let me test whether or not you're worthy of my love and affection and whether or not your worth is, is, is true, right? However, you simultaneously want, want that relationship at all costs. So it's kind of like push, pull, push, pull, push, pull. Um, and somebody who is, doesn't have, doesn't have strong enough placements, isn't going to be able to go toe to toe with you. So that's a little bit tricky in the relationship department. Um, where is Scorpio? Uh, naturally, like such strong Aries energy gives the gives the Scorpio house a lot of power, and your Scorpio house is the eighth house of death, taxes, estates, and business. Um, you'd be excellent, excellent in real estate. You'd be so good at real estate, like so good at real estate. You have no idea how good at real estate you would be. Um, because the, the ruler of your chart is ruling the eighth house of business and estates, the sixth house moon in Virgo is so detail oriented and that moon uh, is ruling the fourth house of home and family via the sixth house of work. Like you would be such a great real estate agent. Anything to do with homes and properties, you would just absolutely kill it. Uh, renovations, flipping, like the whole nine yards, you would do great in that in that arena, that area of life. And part of that is just because you're so competitive and it's a very competitive field and you would just dominate the competition because you can like use that Aries battering ram energy to just go, 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 go. But then the home, the home aspect I think is really important for you because yes, it's a business. Yes, it's a, yes, it's a conquering tool, right? And yes, you can make money from it. But when you're dealing with homes and the places where people would go to live, go to retreat, go to find emotional solace, right? It would, it would really help to ground your emotional space. It would really help to slow you down. It would really help you focus on the finer details. It would really remind you to open up your heart space, stop pressing the gas, you know, slow down, look at every nook, cranny, and crack, uh, distract yourself with the idea of like lighting a scented candle for showings and fluffing the pillows and making things pretty and not necessarily being so worried about the sale, but more about how the home feels, 
Yeah, and that would be a nice kind of counterbalancing distraction for you. Um, we do have a little bit of a spending issue with Venus and Venus and Aries. Uh, Venus, Venus ruling the second house of finance, who's naturally uh, in her fall via Aries, but Aries, the fiery sign of action and initi initiation, like the minute the check comes in, the check goes out. Uh, and so we would need to potentially get, again, somebody else to, to look at financial stuff, because that's it's a little bit of a tricky placement financially, but also honoring your Venus, honoring your planet who rules aesthetics, your planet who rules rest and appreciation, your planet who is literally uh, not being expressed properly in your chart, who rules things like love, affection, and abundance, ruling your financial house, the more you slow down and the more you embody that Venus, that goddess energy, as opposed to the warrior masculine energy that you've, that you've overstacked in your first house of self with Mars, the easier it is for you to, to actually make money and hold on to money at that point, because you're looking at what's actually valuable instead of what you think you need to conquer, right? No issue with spending. We need an issue with kind of hoarding and accumulating the, the abundance. Uh, but where it actually all goes from here is the, the North Node in the fifth house of children and parenting. Like you're here to become a parent at some point. And I think that uh, that being the goal, like you go, 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 go. And then as you, as your life starts to really remind you like, Hey, we're, we're actually here to foster the next generation. We're actually here to do some pretty important things in the, in the parenting and childhood department. Uh, we need to respect that at angle of the chart as well. Like business is great. Self-development is great, but it's not all about you. Is it right? Even, even a partner, like a partner, isn't just a tool to have a balanced life. Like they're not just a scale, right? They're not just there to count to, to counterbalance you and to make sure that you don't fly off your own hinges. Instead, they are actually here to help you raise a family. They are actually here to help you make a life, not just make a living, right? Uh, so that's that's another kind of aspect of the chart. Cool. Thank you, Lorian, for uh, donating your chart to science. Let's go ahead and we will uh, wrap up our live stream for today. So glad everybody uh, has been enjoying the, enjoying the live streams uh, thus far. This is Wednesday. We will be back on Friday for another round of live streams uh, at same time, 1030. If you would like to donate your chart or you have friends and family who are interested in astrology and they would like to donate theirs, feel free to have them private message me birth date, birth place, exact birth time, and I will add them to the list. The list is very long, so please be patient. Please be patient, but I will get to them all. Uh, likewise, if you'd like to schedule a private consult or learn astrology, you can always go to my website, scorpioresingastrology.com, uh, where I have consultation information as well as downloadable online classes for those of you who would like to start learning astrology. But that is it for today. Uh, I will bid you all adieu. Uh, if you are in Florida at all, like me, please enjoy this lovely 64 degree weather, this nice little cold snap that we have going on this morning. Uh, and until next time, may the stars be ever in your favor.